Okay, starting chapter four. Chapter four is just looking, well, it actually starts off with a review of collecting and presenting data, and it's about statistical distributions. So we're going to have a look at a review of what we've done previously, and then we're going to work our way through some new work that we haven't seen before. So the first thing we need to talk about is the types of data. So remember there are two different main types of data. We've got categorical and we've got numerical. Now categorical is known as qualitative because it's about qualities. And remember this is generally the one that we see coming in words. So it's it, you're describing the word or a symbol of something. So for example, what type of car do you drive? What type of pet do you own? So it's something that someone can't give you a number to. However, numerical data known as quantitative, which is generally given or always given as numbers. So quantitative, so how many in terms of quantity. Now, if we look at numerical, there are two different types of numerical data. We've got discrete and we've got continuous. Now, discrete, remember, is the type of data that you can count. So it's the type that comes as a counting distinct number, so a separate value, such as how many people can you fit in that vehicle? Uh, how many people are coming for dinner? Um, what is the number of pets that you have? Um, what score as a percentage did you get in your maths exam? The only one that's discrete that isn't really a whole number is probably shoe size. So shoe size is still discrete because it comes in discrete amounts and it's you know six and a half, seven, eight, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half, for example. But it's a discrete numerical data. Continuous is where it is a continuous scale that you are counting over. So it's a continuous scale. But it's also, I think the easiest way is that the most often it's represented as a decimal. But the question I ask myself when I do continuous data is could the answer be 13.265432? And if the answer is yes, then it's continuous data. If the answer is no, it can't be represented as a, as a long decimal like that, then the answer is it's discrete, if it's a number, obviously. So something like temperatures. Can a temperature be represented as 13.26532 degrees? Yes, it can, so it's continuous data. Can the weight of a footballer be measured as 13.265432 kilograms? Yes, it can. So if something can be represented as a series of decimals or a series of decimal places, then yes, it can be represented as continuous data. When we think of collecting our data, there's a couple of ways we can do it. There's the obvious way, which is the census. And the census is where everyone in the population is surveyed. Very, not very often do we do this. And remember, I don't mean population as in the population of Australia. I mean the population as in the total population, the total group that's being surveyed. Everyone in that group has to be asked. If I don't do a census, then I take what we call a sample. So sample is where we ask a select number of people in the group and we use their views or their opinions, or their responses, in other words, their data, is representative of the entire population. Now, when we choose that sample, we need to choose it very carefully. 
because we could very, very easily choose a biased sample. Now if I choose a biased sample, an example might be, I want to know what your favourite supermarket is, so I stand outside Woolworths in MacArthur Square. I'm standing outside the supermarket, by standing outside Woolworths, clearly most people in Woolworths are going to say, OK, Woolworths is my favourite supermarket. So remember, when you choose that sample, you've got to remember to make sure that you choose it so that it's an unbiased survey and that the selection that you choose will give you data that is representative of the entire population. Now, there are three main ways that we can choose a sample. So there are three types. The first one is what we call a simple random sample. So basically, I just randomly choose people. So if I was taking a selection of students from our school, I would just randomly be picking them off the roll. So I would have a list of all of the students in our school, and I just randomly choose them. I could be selecting phone numbers from the phone book. I could be um, just randomly going down a certain number of street, picking it out of the street directory and then choosing that. The next type that I have is called a systematic sample. Now this is where I follow a system. So perhaps I might look at if I was testing light globes. So I might test at a regular interval. I might test every sixth light globe that appears. Or I might test every tenth car on a production line. If I was going to choose a systematic sample of students in our school, I might put everybody in alphabetical order from A to Z and I might choose every tenth person and then that would be my way of choosing a systematic sample. Now that probably isn't the best way if, let's say, for example, I wanted to change the school uniform or I wanted to change the menu on the canteen because I'm not ensuring that I've represented every year group, every age group and perhaps males and females out of the school. So the best way to do that, however that's not always the best way, it is in this particular case, but the best way to do it in that case is a stratified sample. Now by stratas I mean levels. So if we were looking at our school it would mean that I would be choosing a select number of people from year 7, from year 8, from year 9, 10, 11 and 12. And I would be choosing them in the same ratio or percentage that they are represented in the entire population. So if I said, for example, I wanted to choose how many would I choose from year 12, well I would need to look at how many students are in year 12 out of how many students there are altogether at CPAHS. And that would tell me the fraction. Obviously, it would be easier if I multiplied it then by 100. You can't even see me writing that, so up here. So if I chose year 12 out of how many in year 12, the number in year 12 out of the number in CPAHS, then I would obviously need to times it by 100 to get myself a percentage. And that percentage would then tell me I would then say if I'm going to choose 200 people for my sample of changing the canteen menu, then I would need to find whatever that percentage is. Let's say it came out to be 18%. 18% of 200 would tell me the number of people in year 12 who I would have to choose to be on that sample to adequately represent everybody in year 12. Okay, so if we think about now having a presentation of data, so categorical data is best displayed in a column graph. So this is a column graph turned on its side. Remember, a column graph has spaces between the columns. When there are no spaces between it, that's when we represented it by a histogram. A divided bar graph, so this is a divided bar graph, or a sector graph. And the reason being is because they're separate information, they're not connected together by any numbers, they're just separate categories, separate words, separate entities. So if I look at quantitative or discrete data, so quantitative discrete, so that's numerical discrete in distinct lots. The best way I can do that again is a column graph with my distinct numbers across the bottom here. Stem and leaf is dis puts my scores in a distinct group, all of them from 0, 10s, 20s, 30s and 40s. Or I could put them into a dot plot. 
And again, here in the dot plot, I've got the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50s, for example. The best representation for quantitative or numerical continuous data is a line graph or a radar chart. And the reason being that it's a continuous scale we are representing, and so it's a scale that we need to show continuously. So a line that continues, and this scale continues on. So that we can show on a line graph or a radar chart. And a radar chart we would probably generally use to show two, the comparison of two sets of continuous data. That should be enough now for you to work on completing exercise 401. It's just, as we talked about, a review of collecting and representing um, data. So exercise 401... It's on page 115 of the PDF, and you can do all the questions. That would be 1 through 2, let me just double check, 1 through to 8.